Question, let's start with uh, what are your thoughts on an increasing amount of student debt in the country? I mean, it's because, in my opinion, it's because the uh, employees that are hiring, they want um, experience, like when you graduate, and like you can't get that if you're in school the whole time, and the, you graduate with so much debt because of how expensive school is in the first place, so it sucks. And then when you come out with no experience, then you have no job, no more job, money. more money. Yep. Uh, yeah, I kind of think it's the same thing. A lot of kids, um, we went through kind of this generation of everybody's pressured to go to college. It's like, what are you doing with their life? Don't go to college. So these kids are getting pressured into college and they get degrees that don't mean much and that they don't pay well. And so then they have all these debts that they're trying to pay off that they don't have the job to be able to pay them off. And college every year is getting more expensive and more expensive. So without a plan, these kids go in and then they just end up in a bunch of debt because they don't have a plan because they don't really need to go to college or whatever. And then ends up badly for them. Uh, next question, um, what are some ideas that you guys have to maybe fix or help with the increasing student debt? Um, I mean, obviously, like, eventually I'll be working like during school and I just try to save money that way. Um, just earn, earn as much as I can while I'm in school and just save money because Hopefully, when I graduate, I'll have a decent enough job. But, yeah. Yeah, I just think uh, if kids that are in high school or whatever and they plan on going to college, they got to get a job in high school and start saving up and have a good amount of money to save up to and then have a good plan through college. Just It's really just about planning, planning and budgeting your money the best you can and then end up trying to get as little debt as possible by the end of it. And if you have small enough debt, then you can pay it off a lot easier. And lastly, um, what are your plans to pay it off after you graduate? What were some ideas that you have already? Ideas to pay off student debt? Like right when you graduate. As soon as possible. Is that possible? <laughs> like, I don't like some budgeting ideas that you have. Right. Oh, budgeting ideas, okay. Um, I was thinking, I don't know, uh, maybe like moving back in with my parents save money that way. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, my plan is just kind of uh, get a good budget set up for uh, myself and a uh, good payment plan for my college loans and then pay it off as fast but as steady as I can to where I'm not, you know, being really poor every every week because I have to pay off my student loans but I still have some freedom but I'm paying off at a steady pace broken, an on-path for a catastrophic collision with the labor markets, potentially causing unrepairable damages to the economy and future generations. I'm not a college professor. I don't even work in higher education. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm an economist. And I'm here to tell you a story today. This story starts with cab drivers and firefighters. In 1970, roughly 1% of cab drivers and firefighters had a college education. Fast forward to today, and over 15% do, with no major change in skill set over that period of time. This is education arbitrage. Education arbitrage means different things to different groups and people. For the employer, it's the inefficiency in value between a college education and productivity in the workplace. For the student, it's the disparity in value between a college education and future earnings. Most recently, education arbitrage has been used to describe the imbalance in the labor markets. Specifically, the oversupply of college education. It's why we have more college graduates working in retail than we do soldiers in the U.S. Army. I mean, roughly half of college graduates are in jobs that don't even require a college degree. Yet, colleges and universities continue to talk about their record enrollment and graduation rates, even though we're not, produ we're not producing jobs in the economy to keep up with the supply. It is projected between 2010 and 2020 We'll create 19 million more college graduates, yet the economy will only produce 7 million more jobs that require a college degree. <laughs> the numbers just don't make sense. To say we have a supply and demand issue is an understatement. So the question is, how did we get here? Well, I believe all great economic bubbles typically start with good intentions in the government. Government-sponsored fixed-rate student loans, although well-intentioned, 
do not allow for risk-based pricing, which would help correct the fluctuating markets. You know, as, as a result, you know, student loans are sending more students to college than ever before, but it's just exacerbating the problem. It's why a college graduate makes the same now as they did in 1979, yet tuition has quadrupled over the past 35 years. It's the equivalent of buying a new car, watching the value of that car depreciate, but the price continue to rise. That's great if you're selling that used car, not so good if you're trying to buy a used car. We're breaking the laws of economics, specifically the elasticity of demand. And without risk-based pricing, all colleges and universities and their offerings look the same to student lenders. But we know that's just not true. If we were to go, let's say, get uh, an engineering degree at UC Berkeley, right? We'd make about $1.1 million more than our friend with a high school diploma over 20 years. Not bad, right? But if we went, let's say we got creative, we went down south to Kentucky, to Murray State, and got an arts degree, you know, we would make roughly about $147,000 less than our friend with a high school diploma over 20 year period. Doesn't make sense, that's not as good, right? And so, even though the job opportunities and earning potential are wildly different depending on the institution you chose and the degree that you got, all of these students will face the same student loan payments and interest rates. Doesn't make any sense. As a result, in 2013, the nation's student debt topped out at $1 trillion. Think about that for just a minute. And delinquency is currently 12%, the highest among all forms of credit, and the only continuing to rise in the marketplace right now. This is a sign of underemployment and unemployment, again, due to an oversupply of college education. And as, as students, college graduates have a harder and harder time paying off their student loans, they're not buying homes, they're not buying cars, and ironically, get this, they're not saving for their own children's college education. So those who didn't go to college or didn't do it without taking student debt on, which good luck doing that these days, now have higher rates of home ownership, auto ownership, and credit scores. So that we can say those in higher education in our society aren't necessarily better off than those who didn't go to college. If we don't take action to change the course of education arbitrage, we're setting up our future generations and economy for a disaster. And keep in mind, this is debt that can never be discharged under any circumstances. We essentially have our future generations and economy held at gunpoint. Now, I know all of us want better for our future generations than we've had for ourselves. It's basic human nature. Unfortunately, we push for this beyond reason and logic. In the 80s and 90s, we had a shift in culture and thinking. We started to put preference on self-esteem over reason, on a college degree over a productive work career. We started to believe that the American dream was all about a white-collar job and a college degree. And this career and education arrogance set into our society. And we lost sight of the fact that our economy and society is like an engine that takes many different parts working together to operate. Yeah, some parts are probably more valuable than others. Some probably work harder than, than others. But we need all of those parts for that engine to operate. That's why any job done well in society should be respected. That goes for the attorney in the high rise in Manhattan to the mechanic in Reno, Nevada. This shift in thinking in our culture has sent us down the wrong path. And the latter generations are going to see less opportunity for achievement and advancement than we did ourselves. This is a major failure on our part. Now, I know it's easy to, to state the problems and throw the numbers out there and even point the finger, but the real value comes in creative solutions. I believe that there are four distinct solutions to correcting education arbitrage. First, the government needs to float the student interest rate. This would automatically start to correct the supply and demand issue in the labor markets. Naturally, capital would go to those degrees and institutions that have the highest demand in the labor markets, thus increasing supply. Less capital would go to those degrees and institutions that have less demand in the labor markets, thus reducing supply. And in some cases, it might be eliminating a degree in institution altogether. And there's nothing wrong with this. In a fast-paced information technology economy, we have to have a mechanism in place in which to match the supply of skills and knowledge to the labor markets. And the best way to do that in a capitalistic society is capital. And with higher education, it's the flow of student loans. <laughs> but let's be realistic. This is the government. It's not going to happen. 
So two, colleges and universities need to philosophically rethink the education product. I mean, why do we buy the education product? I mean, I bought the education product because I wanted to get skills and knowledge to be able to have greater earning potential and more job prospects. You know, yet colleges and universities are funded and incentivized primarily through graduation enrollment rates, not placement rates or earning potentials of those that buy their product. I don't know about you, but if I buy a product that doesn't do what it says it's going to do, I'm able to return it. I mean, hell. Ha <laughs> Why not a college education, right? I mean, hell, half, the, half of those that have bought the education product aren't even using it. You know, we, colleges and universities have to step up and take responsibility for the product that they are selling and make sure it has the value they say it does. Now, this is colleges and universities, though. They've seen tuition go up every year. They're probably not going to change. So let's get down to the realistic solutions. Students, including myself from a young age, are told, follow your dreams, follow your passion, follow your heart, right? There's nothing wrong with that, as long as there's good reason behind those decisions. Students have to step up and take responsibility for their future because they will face the consequences of it. And it's fine to follow your dreams and follow your passion. Just make sure that there's a job and a salary at the end of those decisions. And there's many great tools out there, like payscale.com. It will give you a return on investment for every degree from every institution. And at the end of that analysis, someone might say, hey, I don't want to go to college. I don't think that's the right decision. And there's nothing wrong with that decision. This educational shaming in our culture, one, doesn't even mathematically make sense, and two, is just wrong. Which leads to my fourth point. Employers might be the biggest culprit out of everybody in this problem. They've allowed supply to create demand. Think about it. Think about 20 years ago, how many jobs did not require a college degree that do now? And nothing's changed. This is supply creating demand. It's employers being lazy and using a college education as a precursor for employment. But we have about 90 years of data that says that's just not true. Qualities like conscientiousness, motivation, integrity, mental ability are far more predictive of work productivity than education and job experience. I mean, take my own mother, for example, who didn't have the opportunity to finish her college education. There's nothing wrong with that. She's gone on to be a top leader in a 50,000 employee plus company, yet she couldn't even apply for a lot of jobs today. It makes no sense. Employers have to step up and quit letting supply create demand and start rethinking how they're going to evaluate human capital in the new economy. Now, as you can see here from the data we've laid out and the examples we've given, we're creating a massive economic bubble and the higher education system is broken and in dire need for disruption and innovation. Let's imagine a new future, a future where the government floats a student interest rate. We get socially conscious student lenders to where they're looking at and sitting down with students of helping them with the labor markets, understand the labor markets and their return on investment, trying to match student loan payments in the future to the cash flows they're likely to get based on the degrees and salaries from those jobs they'll likely get. And second, colleges and universities start to redesign the education product, focusing more on placement rates and earning potential and return on investment for the product they sell, not graduation enrollment rates. And start pushing back, does a four-year degree even make sense in the modern-day economy? I mean, we're seeing six- and 12-month boot camps and certification for programmers and data scientists. It's time to redesign the education product to fit the 21st century economy. And employers, Employers stop letting supply create demand. They start using the technology and data to truly understand their applicants and their employees and take some responsibility for training as well. Don't put it all into the higher education system and create world-class training within their organizations for the new workforce in this new century. Now, all of us here are responsible for education arbitrage. And all of us are responsible to look at this with eyes wide open and make the necessary decisions and choices to change and correct and eliminate education arbitrage so that we can leave future generations better off than ourselves. Thank you.